Hi, everyone. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are joining us from. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. For those of you who have attended our series before, welcome back. I'm Dr. Megan Wong, a lecturer at the School of Law, University of Essex, where I'm also the founding director of the LLM in International Law degree and the co-founder and co-convener together with Dr. Emily Jones of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. I am delighted to be your host for today's event with our speaker, Professor Patricia Vizier Sellers, which will be chaired by Dr. Jones. I will defer to Dr. Jones, our chair, to introduce Professor Sellers. But in my role as host, I wanted to speak a little bit about the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. Our lecture series was opened this year by Professor Pierre-Marie Dupuy on the universality of public international law in the year 2021 and in the years to come. And we continue today with Professor Sellers' lecture entitled Unlocking Slavery Crimes. Now about our series, this series is built upon two important intellectual traditions of public international law, formalism and international legal practice, international legal theory, including post-colonial and feminist perspectives. The idea for the series stems very much first and foremost from our friendship and is inspired from our respect for each other's scholarship and research. Um, Dr. Jones and I are both generalist public international lawyers with several specialist interests, including mutual interests in international environmental law, international law of the sea, and the law and the use of force, but we write from very different approaches. I'm a formalist and Dr. Jones is a critical legal scholar, and together we hope that this series brings something for everyone um, to enjoy and to engage with. But now let me introduce our excellent chair for today's event. Um, Dr. Emily Jones is my friend, my colleague, my co-founder and co-convener of this excellent lecture series. Dr. Emily Jones is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Essex. She's a generalist public international lawyer specializing in gender and international law, science and technology and international law and international environmental law. Dr. Jones recently published a co-authored book with Zed entitled, the Law of War and Peace, a Gender Analysis, Volume 1, and her monograph is um, entitled Feminist Theory and International Law, Post-Human Perspective. It is forthcoming with Routledge's Glass House series, since that's something that we can all look forward to. Um, and now I will defer to Dr. Jones to open this event. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Wong. As ever, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And of course, it is truly a pleasure to be chairing this lecture by Professor Patricia Vizier Sellers. Prote P Professor Sellers' work has long inspired my own, and I'm very, very proud to have her here joining us, um, Dr. Wong and I, for the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series today. And in fact, I really couldn't think of a better speaker given the themes of our series. Professor Sellers has long worked to bridge the theory and practice divide, working to use theory to very much shape doctrine. And today's lecture promises to give us some insight into her thinking of, across these kind of two supposed divides. But furthermore, her work also really bridges the division between scholarship and practice, which in many ways makes her the perfect fit again for this series. But to give, of course, a more formal introduction to Professor Sellers for you all, and it's obviously quite a biography, as I'm sure you all know, but to give you that background, um, Professor Patricia Vizier Sellers is, of course, an international criminal lawyer. She is a visiting fellow of Kellogg College at the University of Oxford, as well as practicing professor at the London School of Economics and a senior research fellow at the Human Rights Centre at the University of California, Berkeley. In 2021, she was appointed as a special advisor for slavery crimes to the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And she was special advisor on gender to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court from 2016 to 2020. Prior to that, she was the legal advisor for gender, acting head of the legal advisory section and prosecutor at the ICTY from 94 to 2007, and the legal advisor for gender at the ICTR from 95 to 99. Professor Sellers was also a prosecutor on the trial teams of cases including Akayesu, um, Karen uh, Kunarak, sorry, I always struggle with names, and others. <laughs> 
and she's developed uh, multiple legal strategies that led to landmark decisions regarding sexual violence as constitutive conduct of war crimes, crimes against humanity, humanity, genocide, torture, and the enslavement under international criminal law. So lots of really, really important work there um, and very inspirational to myself as a feminist as well, of course. Professor Sellers advises governments and civil society entities and lectures extensively, of course, on international criminal law. And she's authored numerous articles. There's more information in her um, biography. And, and she's also testified as an expert witness before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on several occasions. She is the recipient of the very prestigious Prominent Women in International Law Award, which was awarded by the American Society of International Law. She holds an honorary doctorate in law from the City University of New York, as well as an honorary fellow for lifetime achievement from the Law School of the University of Pennsylvania, which is her alma mater. So as you can see, a very highly established esteemed speaker joining us today. And today, Professor Sellers will be speaking to the title of Unlocking Slavery Crime. So quick housekeeping before we, I hand over to our speaker today. Um, if you do want to ask a question, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. So please use that function and type your question in there. And then I will be reading out the questions to Professor Sellers. Um, you can choose to ask your question anonymously. If you want to do that, then there's like a little box and you click anonymously. Um, if you don't, send it in anonymously, then I might well read out your name. <laughs> so just a warning there. Um, but thank you, of course, to Professor Sellers for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones and Dr. Wong. I'm very pleased to be here and I'm happy uh, to serve as that type of bridge because formalism in the law is, is part of the law. It's integral to the law, as is critical thinking of the law and particularly its application. So please bear with me. Uh, today's lecture uh, might seem long. It seemed very short when I was uh, writing it, but now that I look at it, I, I'm starting to shiver. Oh my goodness, will there be time for questions? But let's begin, okay? Today's lecture is entitled Unlocking Slavery Crimes. And as the special advisor for slavery crimes now to the office of the prosecutor, I want to underscore that I'm speaking today in my completely personal private capacity. I intend to address the questions, how are slavery crimes bound to an ahistorical perception or perceptions of slavery? And how are slavery crimes shackled to structural legal deficiencies in statutes? How are slavery crimes tethered to feminist misconceptions, practitioner myopia, and judicial misinterpretation of international law? Any primordial discussion about slavery must also ask the question, how can slavery crimes be set free or functionally liberated? Each of the above posed questions have been caused, would have been caused for an objection if I were conducting a cross-examination because I've just offered to you leading questions. Each question suggests an answer that's embedded in the inquiry. In essence, this lecture's focus is on unraveling these embedded answers. However, first, what is the meaning of the term slavery crimes? I refer to the main or the core family of slavery crimes under international humanitarian law and criminal law, both under customary law and as enumerated in statutes and treaties. So therefore, I'm talking about slavery or enslavement, and these crimes to a great extent are interchangeable in my usage. And then I'm also talking about the slave trade and lastly about sexual slavery. Now granted, uh, slavery crimes belong to an extended family of crimes. Membership ranges also to crimes of forced labor, servitude, similar institutions uh, to slavery, as well as human rights violations of slavery and the slave trade as expressed in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Another affiliated member, I would say, of slavery crimes are the laws that were previously expressed under the intentionally denominated white slavery treaties. Today, they are grouped under the transnational crime of trafficking, and we can find them as a human rights violation in the Convention to Eliminate Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. 
So we have human rights provisions on trafficking, we have transnational crimes on trafficking, and in particular, they're related to slavery crimes when we're talking about trafficking in human beings. This lecture will return to that member of the family later on when identifying a couple misconceptions or myopia that tether slavery crimes. Where do we begin? Well, we shall embark on the slave ship that crossed the North and South Atlantic to the Americas. Or we could join the slave caravan that traversed the Sahara to the ports of Zanzibar, Oman, to the Ottoman Empire. Each was a slave destination. Slavery and the slave trade were practiced for centuries. Although African populations really underwent the brunt of both East African and transatlantic slave trade, Europeans were also enslaved in particularly in the East African or the Ottoman Empire slave trade. Hence the word slave is a deformation of the word Slav, a European ethnic domination that the entire Yugoslav tribunal was based around. Slav women were prized and valued as enslaved females. In the 18th and 19th century, enslavement in the Americas, North and South and the Caribbean was just one manifestation of the multifaceted generational slavery institutions. That manifestation of enslavement is too often reduced to just images of plantation slavery, uh, fields of cotton, cane sugar, rice, tobacco. Gone are the realities of the enslaved, those who toiled in the general mines in Brazil or the urban centered slavery that you could find in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in the United States. Slaves worked in educational institutions, religious institutions, enslaved males staffed armies. Enslaved males were eunuchs, castrated so that they could interact with enslaved females in the Eastern harems. Enslaved women were maids, cooks, seamstresses, midwives, as well as laborers in the field. During an investigation mission, a trip, as a matter of fact, that I took while working at the Yugoslav Tribunal to the United States, I was reminded that enslaved men were the original jockeys in the Kentucky Derby or the steeplechase horse races. Enslaved men were stevedores, they were longshoremen at the harbors of New York, Charleston, Rio, Bahia, Kingston. And some slaves did nothing, they just existed for the pleasure of their masters. They did not have to work because their mere presence was a way to show the slave master's wealth and status. They were almost like human pets or play objects for their children. The enslaved were also sexually enslaved. Male slave owners raped to terrorize, to punish, or just to exercise their power of ownership over female slaves and at times male slaves. As historian Peter Colchin recounted, masters, their teenage sons, and even on large holdings, the overseers took advantage of the enslaved to engage in a kind of casual, emotionless sex on demand that was unavailable to them from white women. Try and unpack that sentence. In the United States, the sexual practice of slavery extended to the so-called fancy girls. These were female slaves of mixed race origin. They were African with European facial features. They were kept in brothels or in individual homes. And certain enslaved girls were specifically raised or groomed to become fancy girls. A lesser acknowledged but very common sexual practice was committed by upper class white female slaveholders in the United States. They bought, loaned, and exchanged their female slaves as wet nurses to other women so that they could be so that they could breastfeed the white infants profit was derived from the enslaved woman's breast milk it was codified in brazil this practice of wet nursing was called mercenary nursing sexualized and reproductive violence against male slaves was also an essential aspect of slavery and the slave trade slaves were bred procreated to increase the slave population. Enslaved males were traded, they were referred to as bucks, while females were traded and referred to as breeding wenches. The institution of breeding slaves was persistent, consistent, 
the enslaved had to procreate slaves for their masters. This increased the slave owner's wealth, their goods, and their status. It also increased the anguish of the enslaved. Forced procreation of slaves became associated with animal husbandry. And consistently accompanying slavery was slave trading. The transatlantic, or sometimes referred to as the Middle Passage, and the internal or domestic slave trade really dealt with enslaved persons as they moved to sequential situations of slavery, in particularly in the Caribbean and North and South America. This internal slave trade merits scrutiny. However, later, in particular, I want to foreground it for its legal consequences. So the 19th century objection that you in the UK, the British are quite aware of, was an objection to slave trading as it applied to the international commercial pathways of the high seas. Ironically, halting the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade in 1815, by a succession of bilateral treaties between Britain and the Atlantic Ocean slaving nations, such as uh, Brazil, actually entrenched the lucrative internal domestic slave trading. Slaves could not be brought from Africa, so they had to be homegrown. We have images of the transatlantic uh, trade with scenarios of abductions, of captures, of kidnap, and then this transport on ships for the interminable time, months and months, until there was a sale of the person when they arrived in the Americas. That has resonance with us. However, less complete is the imagined scenario of another dynamic the internal slave trade, which continued and dealt generational hardship to new world born enslaved persons. These were the descendants of the original Africans. In the United States, the domestic slave trade was anchored in notorious slave markets located in places like New York City, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans. However, the transfer of this human property or chattel was an established institution also for universities, scientific laboratories, religious institutions such as churches, they all engaged in the domestic slave trade. Slave trading was conducted, was concluded, I'm sorry, by commercial contracts, redemption for debts. Slave trading consisted of exchange by barter or collateral for defaulted loans. Less recognized was a very common practice of the internal slave trade. And that was a trade of slaves among family members by inheritance. The internal slave trade occurred in the form of wedding presents, graduation presents, birthday presents, a convey conveyance of individual gifts or donations to organizations. We will donate you some blacks or we'll bequest them upon our deaths. The internal slave trade was thoroughly ingrained. It was a ubiquitous practice, as was the trade in enslaved children, children, boys and girls, usually enslaved by the very act of their birth. They were a known commodity. Yes, they worked in fields. They were in stables with horses. They worked in the sugarcane distilleries and they watched over the younger enslaved children who were really the goods of their masters. And they watched them until they could become more productive, either in terms of labor or in terms of sexual reproduction. The trade in enslaved children was not hidden, nor was it inconsequential. Look at this memorial plaque from Montgomery. Could you go to the first PowerPoint slide, please? Montgomery is the capital of the state of Alabama in the United States. It refers to the warehouses that warehoused the slaves that were being traded. And the warehouse was critical to cities who had industries that were based upon slave trading. This was very much an urban uh, industry. If you could read this plaque, and I admit it's a bit fuzzy, it talks about enslaved persons were marched up and down in chains and confined until placed on the auction block. If you could pierce very closely, you would see that it also says that the Commerce Street Warehouse 
has advertised the sale of enslaved children, such as a boy. There's one who's 14 and he's very likely and sprightly. Thank you. Yes, children were a commonality of enslaved persons, but slavery itself was so common and the slave trade was common and all of the exercises of powers of ownership and the means to capture slaves, reduce slaves to slavery was the fodder of just every day work for the slave master, but much more for the enslaved. I'd like you to put up the second PowerPoint now. If you could look closely and understand Ask yourself, what is this a picture of? Well, it's a Dutch picture. It's painted by uh, Christian van Kohenberg. And he was from Delft. And this is a painting that's between 1604 and 1667, taking place in Holland. The painting is entitled, Three Young White Men and a Black Woman. It's known as The Rape of the Negro Girl. The painting is in the style of the Dutch masters. The painting technique is competent, not extraordinary. Uh, it's rather emblematic of a period when Dutch painting was at its apogee, along with Dutch slave trading in the Caribbean and in Suriname. Can you imagine who posed for this painting? Whose idea was it to paint this picture? Who bought this picture? The Rape of the Negro Girl currently hangs amid the collection of 17th century tableaus, tableaus in the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Strasbourg in France. Today, the painting's subject matter might startle or disturb. This is a common reaction when we gain actual knowledge of the institutions, practices, and rationales for slavery and its constant companion, the slave trade. Thank you. You can put the picture down. In the rush to redress modern day slavery, that wonderful phrase, there resounds a refusal to grasp with the crushing banality of historical slavery and the slave trade. This albeit incomplete factual review that I've just given you offers the embedded answer of how slavery crimes remain bound to a historical perception, an ahistorical perception in international humanitarian law and international criminal law today. The co-author of articles that I have written, Professor Jocelyn Getkin Kirstenbaum, and I have often contemplated that underneath the international prescription of slavery in the slave trade that took place in the 1926 slavery content, uh, convention, we can understand that slavery was a norm. It was characterized as a norm. Now that's being contested as to whether it was a regional European norm. Notwithstanding at the time of its adoption, the transatlantic slave trade, domestic slavery and the internal slave trading had ceased in the Americas and the Caribbean. Caribbean. The 1926 slavery convention did not directly outlaw the massive internal slavery or slavery in the Americas. They had ceased up to 50 years earlier. Brazil was the last country in the Americas in 1888 to abolish slavery. But the drafters of the 1926 convention primarily intended to outlaw ongoing slavery in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. So the 1926 convention also served another very important purpose. It drew a distinction between slavery and the use of forced labor, which would become essential to how the European powers would configure indigenous labor and their expanding colonial economies. The slavery convention nonetheless holds great importance and particularly from a formalist point of view. The 26, 1926 convention and then its reiteration in 1956, the Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery and the Slave Trade, defined slavery. And the definition was as follows. Slavery is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all the powers attaching to the right 
of ownership are exercised. Slavery in all its forms, meaning slavery recognized under law, namely de jure or chattel slavery, as well as de facto slavery, that sanctioned by social customs, was outlawed in the 1926 Slavery Convention. And that outlawing was reiterated in the 1956 Convention. The drafters intended thereby to prescribe all forms of slavery, urban slavery, plantation slavery, educational, religious, or scientific institutional slavery, the slavery of the fancy girls. They outlawed the raping, castrating, and breeding or procreation of slaves, the commodifying of slaves' breast milk, and any form that evidenced an exercise of powers of ownership over a person. All of these intersecting acts, indicia of slavery, forms of ownership, the entirety of slavery, come under the prescription, the outlawing, the 1926 convention, as reiterated in the 1956 convention. Additionally, those conventions meticulously outlawed the international slave trade and the internal or domestic slave trade. Now, be very aware that the intent of the drafters was to eradicate the slave trade. It was more than just the bilateral eradications that occurred in the 1800s. The definition of the slave trade in the 1926 convention is as follows. All acts involved in the capture, acquisition, or disposal of a person with the intent to reduce him or her I placed in the him or her to slavery. All acts involved in the acquisition of a slave with a view to selling or exchanging him or her. All acts of disposal by sale or exchange of a slave acquired with a view to being sold or exchanged. And in general, every act of trade or transport. The slave trade definition condemns perpetrators who intend to reduce any person of any age into a condition of de jure or de facto slavery. And just as important for any perpetrator who intends to exchange or transport someone who's already been enslaved to another situation of slavery. The 1926 convention recognized that slavery and the slave trade occur together in tandem. There are practices, these are practices, and these institutions are interlinked, yet they are distinct crimes. Slavery criminalizes the status or the condition of the enslaved person. The slave trade criminalizes the reduction of that person to slavery or the further conveyance of the enslaved. Slave trading is not a lesser included offense or a subset of slavery. Their elements are distinct, not overlapping. Moreover, and importantly, the slave trader is not merely an accessory to slavery, such as an aider or a better. The slave trader commits a distinct crime. The slave trader might intend and therefore act to reduce a person to the status of slavery, only to learn that the buyer chooses not to execute powers of ownership, chooses to free the person. Notwithstanding, the act of slave trading has been committed. It's analogous to the transfer of illicit goods with the intent to dispose of them through sale, whether you dispose of them or not the transfer of illicit goods is a distinct crime. From the victim's point of view and under the law, slavery and the slave trade are separately perpetrated. They are both egregious crimes. Well, you would say, well, that's a pretty solid legal foundation. So how are slavery crimes shackled to structural legal deficiencies of statutes? Simply, because slavery and slave trade are shackled by their absence of inclusion, by their omission, by the reneging on this two-punch legal framework in most charters and most statutes, whether it's war crimes or crimes against humanity. The London Charter and the Tokyo Charter that governed the international military tribunals after World War II recognized enslavement as a crime against humanity. The London Charter recognized deportation to slave labor as a war crime. But Neither of those two charters expressly paired slavery or enslavement and the slave trade together as crimes against humanity or explicitly as war crimes. 
whether deportation is analogous to the crime of the slave trade was never clarified in Nuremberg, nor in the Nuremberg principles. Deportation today, along with forcible transfers, stands starkly independent, almost indifferent to the practice of slavery. It's not necessarily a precursor like the slave trade is to slavery. Furthermore, the statutes of the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Extraordinary Criminal Chambers of Cambodia and the Extraordinary African Chambers and the International Criminal Court list enslavement as crimes against humanity, but they're dead silent about similar jurisdiction for the slave trade as a crime against humanity. Shackled to these structural legal deficiencies is what has occurred to slavery and the slave trade. War crimes under the Yugoslav and Rwanda statute might be implicitly able to include slavery and the slave trade, but neither of those tribunals generated jurisprudence on that combined effect of slavery and the slave trade, nor anything on the slave trade. However, the real menacing and also the manacling, the shackling of the in tandem function of slavery in the slave trade is their legal abdication as war crimes in the statute of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, in the extraordinary chambers of Cambodia, and most curious, if not deleterious, in Article 8, the war crimes provision of the Rome Statute. Yes. There are no war crimes under the Rome Statute that entail provisions for slavery and the slave trade. However, it could be questioned, well, has that absence exerted a real harm? I would answer yes. From the AFRC case to the Charles Taylor case, from Lubanga to Entaganda to Ongwen, child soldiers find no legal characterization in war crimes the war crimes that were committed against them as slaves. Child soldiers recruited, conscripted, kidnapped, abducted, distributed, trained, trained to kill, loot, burn, capture other children, rape other children, maim other children and adults, often on the penalty, upon the penalty of their own death, have to be understood as enslaved children. Can slaves be both victims and perpetrators? Yes. However, the structural deficiencies by excluding slavery in the slave trade as war crimes facilitates the impunity under the Rome Statute for these slavery crimes. Additional Protocol 2 of the Geneva Convention recognizes slavery and the slave trade in all their forms as war crimes, as does Rule 94 of the ICRC study on customary law. The synchronized legal framework of slavery and slave trading are dismantled, disabled, gutted, tightly shackled when their provisions are absent from statutes or national penal codes. This leaves the specific acts of enslavement and slave trading of children blatantly unredressed. Again, real consequences are wrought with the absence of the slave trade not being recognized as a crime against humanity. The Jennifer W. case recently completed in Germany under universal jurisdiction, condemned a female ISIS member for the death and aiding and abetting and the enslavement of the Yazidi children, Yazidi children. The possibility to charge aiding and abetting for slave trading of that child was untenable due to the unavailability of, German, of a German legal provision. Can you fathom that given our knowledge about the slave trade administration set up by ISIS, an apparatus that is analogous to historic slave trading institutions of adults and children, that we have incapacity to redress the practice of slave trading. Slavery or enslavement does not suffice when slavery and slave trading are the criminal conduct. The Jennifer W. case underscores the shackling of slavery crimes by structural legal deficiencies. Well, you might say, instead of dwelling on what is excluded in the law, let's concentrate or let's rejoice on the revival of slavery crimes that are in black letter law and that are expressly included. 
Oh, you might say, remember sexual slavery. What a triumphant feminist win, both conceptually and in terms of its legal structure. However, the celebration might be premature or inappropriate. To date, provisions for sexual slavery have been used to prosecute slavery-related rape, as well as forced marriage conduct, tried under crimes against humanity, other inhumane acts. Sexual slavery provisions require that the perpetrator, in addition to exercising powers of ownership over the person, that the perpetrator cause the person or persons to engage in one or more acts of a sexual nature to engage in one or more acts of a sexual nature. Sexual slavery, as you understand, carries an additional evidentiary burden or proof. It is harder to prove than enslavement. The ICC jurisprudence acknowledges that there is no exhaustive list of situations or circumstances that delimit or restrict when and how such powers can be exercised in terms of someone being held out or forced to engage in an act of a sexual nature. However, that additional element, that causing of the engagement of an act of a sexual nature so far has only been limited to heteronormative male and female acts of rape, such as in the cases of Intiganda and Onguin. The provision of sexual slavery has fallen short of protecting the enslaved from the myriad ways in which sexualized slavery manifests. That sexual slavery provision would be challenged to offer protection for the exercise of power of ownership over reproductive fluids, such as male semen, the commodification or control of breast milk, is that being held out for a sexual, an act of a sexual nature, or the verification of menstrual flows, gynecological experiments, castration, the grooming of prepubescent girls to become concubines or fancy girls or boys to become sex objects. This conduct does not entail necessarily the holding out of someone for an act of a sexual nature or their engagement in an act of a sexual nature. Thus, they could elude the protection of sexual slavery. However, it is clear that patterns of conduct that are the banal exercise of powers of ownership over sexual autonomy and integrity exist. And I think those that I've just listed are indicative of those powers and the banality of the acts. The Ongwen Chamber even excluded the forced pregnancy of enslaved girls from being characterized as sexual slavery. The Ongwen Chamber cited the rule of surplage surplusage, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one correctly, or anyway, that was their reason for refusing to place forced pregnancy conduct under sexual slavery. Why? Would sexual slavery be too burdened, too laden? Or maybe they should have interpreted their decision in a much more satisfactory but complex way. The forced pregnancies were part of the acts of enslavement of those women, not sexual slavery, enslavement. From the best feminist intentions to surface rapes during slavery, it's better to comprehend that the historic and the current sexualized conduct of, enslaving, of enslavement and slavery cover and safeguard all acts, whether one is held out or one is prohibited from, whether one is groomed, whether one is guarding their own fluids, or whether one is psychologically berated in sexual terms. Ongwen unwittingly demonstrates that the customary law understanding of sexualized enslavement represents an ameliorated approach to slavery crimes. Sexual slavery has tethered slavery crimes, even though it's well-intentioned. Its misguided concepts fall foul to, I think, both practitioners and to judicial misinterpretation. So how do we get freedom for slavery crimes? 
Well, first of all, I think we recenter the breadth of the historical lived experience of the African slaves and their enslaved descendants, including recognizing the ample scope of sexualized enslavement as a form of enslavement and the numerous, numerous forms of domestic slave trading. I think we have to revitalize the application of the slave trade along with its legal partner, slavery. And there's some concrete ways to do it. Amending the Rome Statute so that under Article 8, slavery and the slave trade are contained in the provisions for war crimes. Amending the Rome Statute under Article 7 so that the slave trade can join back with enslavement and give us this two-pronged punch. The slave trade should be included as a provision of crimes against humanity. And I think that we should rethink and possibly reinsert and strengthen enslavement by moving sexual slavery back into our understanding of slavery, our historical understanding of slavery. The international law of slavery and the slave trade was generated by the sweat and the soul dearth of Africans and their descendants. Such recentering, basically through critical race theory, but I would argue critical race facts, are a way to reinvigorate the laws of slavery crimes. As it was applied, misapplied, I would say, to the comfort women, neither their enslavement nor their slave trading was officially recognized those facts down, stand clear. And as today, we could apply it to the IZD females and to the boys who were child soldiers. Both of these groups were enslaved. We have to recognize the enslavement of children, whether child soldiers or groomed girls, and recognize their sexual harms. Do not erase slavery crimes, in particularly the slave trade. Do not substitute them, in particularly the slave trade for the white slave trade or trafficking, a transnational crime. These are different crimes, different jurisdictions, but they offer complementary protection. It's not one or the other. And in particular, it's not one instead of the other. Slave trading should stand tall along with trafficking. We cannot eradicate slavery in the slave trade if we're content to lock up, shackle, or tether the dynamic power of the slave trades and slavery crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Stellas, for that excellent lecture. I have um, written so many notes myself. Um, and we have a few kind of questions coming in. And just a reminder to the audience, if you do have questions, then please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen um, to ask your questions there. Um, we have a couple that have come in um, to start off with. Um, so the first one is from somebody anonymous, um, so a mysterious person, um, and they thank you for a fascinating presentation. And they say, um, if I understand you correctly, you outlined a problem in international criminal law where slavery is not linked to the wider slave trade enough, um, creating a silence around the latter. And you also noted the ways at the end that trafficking is seen as different to um, slavery crimes. And, I, this person is therefore wondering why you think that there is a silence around these linkages. Okay, well, I think that there's a silent, I think there is a silence around these linkages and thank you because they understood exactly what I was saying. And why do I think there's a silence around these linkages? Well, I think that it has to do with several reasons. And, and one is a silence around just the, his, the historical facts that relate to transatlantic uh, slavery. I think that we can see now as we're going through the reckoning, the reconciliation, racial awareness, how hard it is to, to discuss uh, the slave trade and to discuss slavery and how difficult it is to really discuss the actual practices that were part of the institution of everyday slavery and everyday slave trading. Uh, we have to, in some ways, recognize that these will be painful discussions. And in law, we want to be so rational. We want to make sure that they oh, follow these elements and we've solved your problem. But a uh, law is embedded with the experience of these African and African descendants. 
ended slaves. Certainly the 26th convention and the 56th convention. But it appears that what happened is that at the same time the slavery convention was um, being drafted, there had been several conventions related to the white, uh, white slavery, which basically looked at issues of cross-border prostitution, whether it was borders in between states or provinces or um, within a different country. And somehow this you know, has transformed itself that we refer to this white slavery as trafficking. And this trafficking became um, embedded in CEDAW in Article 7, of course, and it also started to take over, I would say, our means of analyzing slave trade, even as a human rights violation under the International Covenant of Civil Political Rights. So today you hear people talking about, oh, you mean trafficking, and they can't even have a conceptualization understanding of slave trading. And both can exist. Many, many um, commercial sex workers, many trafficked people are really slave traded and enslaved. And so we should really use all of the jurisdictions we have to confront the problem. But uh, I would almost say, and not being facetiously, there has been a whitewashing with the white slave trade of the African derived slave trading and slavery. Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sellers. Um, I actually had a question that came in that is kind of related on that. So I wanted to draw that one in. I'm trying to think of some links here. Um, so again, it's another anonymous question, but it's um, this person says that they've heard a lot about debates around modern slavery, and that's an in inverted commas, um, particularly from people who argue that the concept silences the crimes of the past by focusing on something quite different in the present, but using the same language. And the person says that you seem to be quite critical of this concept too, of, of, sla of modern slavery, but yet you also give a very broad context to slavery, and you also seem to hold a lot of hope in the use of slavery in law. So they're therefore wondering what you think about these kind of wider concerns. Yes, I think modern slavery uh, has a kind of like a nice, a nice ring to it, okay? But I don't know whether anything that is happening today, contemporary slavery, is much different from certain aspects and institution of historical slavery. So you're saying, well, no, uh, you know, modern slavery is about holding women in a brothel. Well, yes, New Orleans could show you some of their archives and you could understand that. Dar es Salaam uh, had con concubinage slavery that they wanted to, could you just delay the abolition of slavery until we kind of understand what we'll do with the concubines? Uh, so I don't think that there is much in modern slavery that doesn't have some type of resonance with historical slavery. And I don't like this artificial division as if we have to make new, um, uh, not necessarily new laws, but look at it in a new way. It helps us, again, uh, refuse to look at historical uh, slavery. And I haven't even begun to understand uh, within this presentation of how we place the enslavement of indigenous persons within the uh, Americas and the slavery that went on within the Malaysia plantation systems uh, from India. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sellers. So, yeah, that, that kind of really helps clarify, I think, your position on that. And I think it's quite an interesting um, debate. So it's good to have your perspective. Um, we have a question that's come in from Opelua Dada. Um, and they ask, um, can we truly eradicate slavery in a world where the gap between rich and poor countries continues to grow? Um, they say this is just a reality. The rich are doing what they can and the poor are still suffering. And well, what can we kind of do about this is the question. Well, I think slavery has always been an economic and a political institution, institutions. Uh, many nations were really slaveocracies, you know, part of their economy and their political structures were built upon the continued use of not cheap labor, labor that had no cost. I mean, that's what that's what slavery is and goods and services that had no cost. Uh, today, when we talk about the care economy, well, slavery uh, traditionally, historically in the Americas was part of the care economy too. Uh, you know, the caring for little children, uh, for a birthday, a child would get a slave to accompany them so they could be played with uh, throughout, you know, childhood. So yes, there is always an economic, but I would also add a political and a cultural and a racial, racialization of slavery. And that's one of the things the transatlantic slave did. And today, 
we don't imagine um, the racial aspects or the ethnic aspects or the different caste aspects that still inform slavery. Great, thank you very much um, for that answer. Um, so I have one that has come in here that takes a slightly um, different turn. Um, it's, so it comes in, um, oh, from an anonymous person again. So um, it says, um, as you surely know, there's been a lot of feminist critique of trafficking. So in particular, feminists have critiqued the US's use of trafficking to further their own agenda, but also in the ways in which the kind of focus on trafficking perpetuates a, a gender victim narrative in international law. Um, and this person is asking, what are your thoughts on this and how could you, or will you, or do you address this in your own work? No, I do not address trafficking in my own work other than to distinguish trafficking as a transnational crime from the slavery crimes. But I do know that trafficking has become uh, to that extent politicized. When we put out a yearly report in the United States or in other countries and we have special rapporteurs on trafficking, uh, what we do is we, ma we make them emphasize uh, trafficking and we make them disregard slave trading. And among the differences from trafficking is this focus on uh, the victim and will the victim be able to remain in the country and testify. If we were to look at that person in some instances as being an enslaved person, our concern should be that person's liberation, not whether that person even needs to continue to perform within you know, the judicial system or whatever. I mean, those become the rights of an individual uh, person at that time period. So what I think that um, as feminists can do is as we look at trafficking, and I'm, we do because it's Article uh, 7 from the CEDAW uh, Convention, that we have to look at the new general recommendation that also distinguishes other crimes out, smuggling, slave trading from trafficking, and be able to use all of these legal tools and not feel that we have to make trafficking turn into everything we need, but to understand that they're complementary jurisdictions that we could and act a better way out of, um, as you, the, well, the prior anonymous person said, uh, this illegal economic uh, pushed activities. Great, thank you so much. It's a, a really interesting answer and lots to think about there as well. Um, so we have a little bit more time for a few more questions. So we have one here, um, which comes in from Sahrad uh, Fulavan, Fulavan, sorry if I said that completely badly, I really apologize. Um, but they say, hi, thank you, Professor Sellers, for the amazing talk. Um, and they wonder if moving away from a very formal view or from formalism and focusing instead on a very functional view can be more effective in tackling, tackling slavery crimes. What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think that they're correct, but I think that we can do both at the same time. As a matter of fact, um, slavery crimes uh, if they functioned correctly within the different statutes, I think would be able to, with good investigation, good submissions and good interpretation, uh, open up a, a way to see actually the egregious nature of some things in our world. But let me just give you a very, what I think a very practical uh, example is. Uh, the slave trade is a crime that doesn't depend upon exercising powers of ownership. Uh, it doesn't depend on slavery actually happening. So therefore, you just have to, as a slave trader, intend to reduce the person into slavery. But you might do that by transferring, selling, conveying that person to another slave trader. And you're just one of the slave traders in the long chain. I mean, that is much easier in some ways to prove than exercising powers of ownership. It's like the captain of the, of the cargo ship. They don't own the cargo. They're transporting the cargo. And it's easier to prove than instances of trafficking, where depending on the age, you would have to make sure that you proved that there were coercive circumstances and that there was a means and that the person was finally reduced to exploitation. You don't have to prove that with slave trading. So I don't understand why we're not using slave trading more frequently. In addition to that, as I said, slave trading is always a precursor to slavery, except for children born into slavery. And usually the enslaved during their lifetime are slave traded several times. So we have to understand, you know, uh, this um, paying for a debt, gifting someone, uh, paying um, or exchanging are just kind of everyday forms of slave trading. 
and that it's not uh, this uh, necessarily this horrendous uh, monster that we have to control. It is so banal. The differences are such as in ISIS that have set up administrations uh, to slave trade and then to regulate the enslaved after they're slave traded. Great, thank you so much, Professor Sellers. Um, I think we probably just have time for one more, if that's okay with you. Um, this is coming from one of our students, but they don't want me to say their name. So um, <laughs> everyone's very shy today. Um, but they thank you again for your fantastic lecture. Um, and they say that they, they found the way that you're using kind of critical theory to rethink the actual law very inspiring in your lecture. And this is something they're struggling with in their own work. This is quite a general question, but they're asking if in your vast experience, how can lawyers most effectively apply theory to the law, um, both generally, but also in this specific case of slavery? Well, you know, I think it's a good question. And I think it's more than just a case by case basis. I think that there, I think that all legal regimes have theories and policies behind them. And I think that it's just as important to understand, you know, those formalistic theories and policies that are behind every legal regime and then to understand what facts can apply to them and, and where they reach coverage in terms of governing and resolving situations or making sure that there are no violations uh, or no crimes and where do they fall short? And then asking yourself, why do they fall short and for whom do they fall short and under what consistent or inconsistent basis? And is that built into you know, the legal regime itself? And so I think that uh, if you approach it, I know I do, as this kind of fascinating you know, puzzle, I mean, I ask myself, uh, slightly getting off subject, well, why do we have, you know, we're so proud of the fact that now we have the crimes for conscription and enlistment of children or their use in hostilities, but yet we don't want to protect them when they're enslaved. I mean, we have, does that make sense, particularly since slavery is like a use cohesion crime? Well, that, that puzzle piece is not fitting in there. Uh, anymore. And what about those boy soldiers who maybe they didn't want to, in quotes, marry those girls? Are they being forced? Are they sexually exercising powers of ownership over those boys who now have to show that they're, you know, good male soldiers and marry those girls who they don't want to? So this is, you know, how the, the theory can inform the practice, but also the policy has to be understood so that you can understand what theory is being pushed and which one possibly needs to be altered and changed. Fantastic, thank you. Um, really helpful, I think, for our students to hear that as well. Um, we did have one more question that I just want to ask you because it's a good one that's coming, if that's okay, and then I promise it will be yeah. the last one. Um, so it comes in from G.S. Gilbert, who might be Professor Jeff Gilbert at Essex, but I'm not sure because I can't see the full name. But um, it says, first, many thanks to Professor Sellers. And the question is, why do you think the ILC in its draft articles on the crimes against humanity did not address slave trading, given that the ILC is made up of independent experts and not governments? It's a good one. Yeah, I think that what the uh, ILC wanted to do was replicate the Rome statute. And I think that their underwriting basis was we, we want to have a crimes against humanity policy that looks just like the Rome statute. So US, China, India, Russia, uh, you didn't sign up to the Rome Statute, but you can sign up to this, and basically everyone's under the same law. And I think that there were other civil society groups and government groups that said, look, this is our chance to make a Crimes Against Humanity Treaty that really responds to the needs of the civilian population. And while the Rome Statute might have its benefits, we can have one that is even better. So now there is discussion in terms of going forward with uh, the Sixth Committee as to other ways to amend the Crimes Against Humanity uh, statute beyond a uh, treaty, proposed treaty, beyond the provisions that are in the Rome statute, Crimes Against Humanity. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much. Great to have your insights on that as well. Um, I'm aware that you're also an hour ahead of us, so it's even later <laughs> where you are than where we are. So um, it's probably better to finish um, on a, a very high note there. Um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you so much for joining us and for your really fantastic lecture. Um, yeah, thank you. And Dr. Wong, did you want to say a few words? Um, I just wanted to echo Dr. Jones in giving thanks to Professor Sellers for this really um, fantastic lecture and as well to our audience for um, attending and for your attention. And also thanks. join us next week um, for
a lecture by Professor Ursula Crevon. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Sanders, for joining us. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.